Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, we're, we're going to start the teacher takeaways, um, practical ideas for classroom teaching, the session today. And um, first of all, uh, I'm going to do some housekeeping. So that would be the next slide, please. Yes, okay. Um, I'm Jimmy Zhang, and I'm, I'm the chairperson and the moderator for today. Before we start, here is the housekeeping. So um, I hope all the teachers can keep your um, microphone on mute, old, mute mode. So, and also, also turn off your uh, videos because we don't want to uh, be interrupted during the whole session. Um, but you can leave the comments in the uh, chat box. We can see them. And also we have the Q&A sessions at the end. And you can type all your questions anytime and during the session. And we are going to pick up all the questions or some of the questions to answer at the end, okay? Um, so um, this is the housekeeping. And I, I'm going to briefly introduce me and the presenter today. Uh, I'm not going to read all the words on the screen. You can have a look at that later because you're going to see the slides on British Council website for free, okay? So briefly, I worked, I've been worked with British Council for more than 11 years. Of course, not full time. I work as the um, uh, teacher training program consultant since 2010. And during that, uh, I did a lot of road, uh, road show workshop with other presenters together in China. And also, um, I did a lot of other teacher training uh, for all the levels around China and in other countries, including Japan as well. Uh, it, it's good that today's presenter is also, you know, working in Japan. Um, so, um, I also worked for Cambridge Assessment for about five years. All right, so for the rest, you can read the slide yourself after the session. Now here comes the presenter today. I'm going to introduce Robin Skipsey today, okay? So um, Robin, is, uh, Robin uh, is the um, academic manager for English for Education Systems in Japan in British Council. And before he started working um, with Br British Council Japan um, in 2007, he actually uh, worked as a teacher in a lot of uh, uh, public schools, for example, the elementary schools, junior high and senior high schools. And also he covered the university level classes as well. So you can see, He's very experienced in many, many levels in our educational field. So that's a great experience for us, for us to listen. Uh, that's a great experience for him to share all the useful ideas uh, uh, with us today. And he's also the material developer for school uh, English textbooks. So you can see he, he nearly covers all the areas in an educational field, right? So we are very honored and pleased to have Robin Skipsy on board today. Now, let's welcome Robin Skipsy. Thank you for that very nice uh, introduction, Jamie. Thank you very much. Um, so my, my experience has um, mostly been in, in Japan. Um, I hope that there will be some similarities uh, with uh, with your experience if you're joining from China or from elsewhere in the region. Uh, obviously, there will also be some significant differences, I'm sure. But I hope you find something in this presentation that will be that will be helpful for you. So, um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background uh, about this session, we. Um, we designed this session based on questions from teachers. We, we conducted a survey with teachers working at junior and senior high schools, so upper, uh, lower or upper secondary level, and their questions about teaching listening. And that's what this session has been designed around. And we're going to try and look at um, six 
uh, different uh, points in uh, listening. One, motivation. Uh, two, the stages of listening. Uh, three, dictations and the role of reading. Four, single play or double play. Five, different accents. And six, the role of note taking. Um, and I will try and get through those six points and also have time for some questions at the end. If you have questions, though, um, please do put them into the chat um, as your list. The first point we're going to look at is motivation. And here are some typical teachers' questions. How do I raise my students' motivation to listen? When I play the audio, it's like playing a nursery rhyme. The students start falling asleep, was one question. Another one was, how do I get my students to be less passive during listening activities? Are there any techniques for raising students' interest and curiosity? And uh, another typical question, how do I help students to maintain their curiosity and motivation while listening? So we're going to start with these, uh, uh, with, with some kind of pointers to these questions. Now, some, some of the keys to motivation are, are to have a, a purpose or a goal for listening. If you don't know why you're doing something, it's quite hard, hard to be motivated to do it. And uh, another key is to understand the situation that you're listening to. Again, if, um, if you don't know what's going on, uh, it, can, it can be difficult to be interested in, in, in listening to it. Uh, and finally, having curiosity um, is another key factor. And this is one that's backed up by, by quite a lot of research. Uh, students who are curious, whether it's um, before they listen or, or before they read something, uh, tend to comprehend better as well. So bearing in mind these three keys to motivation, we're going to look at what happens uh, sometimes in classrooms where there's a, a listening activity. So th this is example one. And the example teacher talk goes like this. Okay, everybody, it's listening time. Please listen very carefully. And then the teacher plays the audio. And then the teacher says, OK, now answer the questions on page 36. And after that, the teacher might say, who got all correct answers? Raise your hands. OK, who got seven correct? Who got five correct? Who got one correct? OK, we'll try harder next time. So if we look at this example. And think again about the keys to motivation. Do you think um, that uh, in this example, students have a purpose or a goal for their listening? Uh, do they understand the situation before they listen? And, and are they likely to be curious about the listening? Uh, I'd be interested if you could just quickly type into your into the chat um, a yes or a no to these questions. And I'm saying no, not at all. <laughs> not at all, no. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think um, there seems to be a lot of, uh, definitely not, I see, nope. There's a, a lot of agreement that, um, uh, that there's not much to, to motivate students in this, in this scenario. So what can teachers do differently? Well, we're going to look at another example. This is example two. And in this example, um, we're using uh, a listening from a British Council resource. So you can find these um, listening resources online. Okay, so the example teacher talk could go like this. OK, we're going to listen to Tom talk to his mum about studying. And you can see Tom in the picture there. Uh, he's the boy in the, he's in his bedroom. You can see he's got a lot of books. Um, his bed's behind him. And he obviously needs to do some studying. But Tom has some problems with studying. What kind of problems do you think he might have? Uh, for example, maybe he's got too much to study. Can you think of any other ideas, any other problems he might have with his studying? Perhaps you could put one or two of them in the chat. Any ideas? Or maybe he's having problems concentrating. So yes, he might have noisy neighbors. Absolutely, that might be disrupting his study. Absolutely. Maybe he doesn't understand uh, what it is that he's studying. OK, so um, now we're going to listen to Tom talk to his mum. We're going to listen and find out what problems he has. And then at this stage, I press 
play and the students listen. Uh, and then I might say now, uh, please discuss your answers uh, with your partner. What problems did you hear? What did Tom say? Please discuss it with your partner. So in this example two, um, the students have uh, an idea of the situation. They've had an idea to, they've been able to get used to, to at least one of the speakers in the listening. They, they've got an image of what the, uh, what the speaker looks like and they've got a purpose. So their purpose is listen and find out what problems Tom has. And so the key points um, for this kind of introduction is you need to introduce who is talking, and also where they are and, and maybe what they're doing. And secondly, give students a purpose for listening. So don't say just listen very carefully, but you know, listen and find out um, with, a, with a suggestion. And just doing those two things can make a, a quite big difference uh, to students' motivation because now they're a little bit more in control of the situation. They're not listening uh, without any information. They know why they're listening and, and they've got an idea of what kind of things they're listening for. A couple of other things that you can do to improve student motivation is to get students to discuss their answers in pairs and to give evidence for their answers rather than simply listening and, and, and writing, a, you know, circling a multiple choice answer, get them to discuss what they heard. And if students have misheard something, you can explore the reasons why and turn this into a learning opportunity. And following these points can make quite a big difference uh, to student motivation and help them to become more active, more mentally active when they're listening. Um, you might not always have pictures to show of the, of the people that are in the audios in your textbooks. In that case, another thing that you can do is to play a short part of the audio and say, you know, listen to the voices, what kind of person do you think this is? Can you describe how old you think they are? Do they sound like a, a kind person or an impatient person? And this kind of activity warms students up and gets them more engaged in what they're listening to. On one other point, uh, students will lose motivation if they can't understand what they're listening to. This is pretty obvious. If I played you um, an audio that was in Portuguese or Russian and you didn't speak those languages, you'd very soon stop listening to it. And uh, it's the same with students. If they're listening and it's just not understanding it, it's extremely demotivating. So teachers can help by, first of all, pre-teaching some of the words and phrases in the listening. I think a lot of teachers do this. Um, but it, one important point to think about is to focus on how the vocabulary sounds uh, rather than just writing the words on the board because students need to understand it when they're listening. They need to recognize the sounds. And secondly, by breaking up long audio into short sections uh, and checking understanding before you move to the next one. If you have a, a very long audio and students are really struggling, um, then they're going to quickly lose motivation. So breaking it into short chunks, checking understanding, maybe replaying the first chunk again. Th these are all techniques that you can use to help students uh, engage more actively in listening. I'm going to just quickly um, look at the chat before I move on to the next section to see if there's any other questions. Um, I can't see I can't see any other questions so I'm going to, to move on to the next section. The stages of listening. So here are two uh, teacher questions that we received. One was, I'd like to know if there are any steps we should be aware of when teaching listening. And another teacher who said, if we want to start focusing on listening early at school, what tools should we use? So I'd like to look at stages through the school system, beginning in early primary or early elementary school. At elementary school, the focus is on sounds and meaning. So students, need to hear slow, careful speech. So here are some example listening teaching activities. Uh, one example is Simon Says. So um, where here students listen and then they move. So for example, the teacher might say, Simon says, touch your head. And the students listen and they touch their heads. Um, there are other activities maybe with flashcards or objects where the teacher says something and the students listen 
and touch it. Uh, stories and songs are another example of um, a listening activity that's very appropriate for elementary school. And very small dialogues. Um, these could be, you know, what's your favorite color? Um, or uh, uh, role play dialogues where, where students introduce themselves to different people. Um, the advantage of a dialogue is it involves not only listening, but also speaking and responding. And um, the kind of things that, uh, if we look at, for example, stories and songs, it's a, a kind of story that, uh, the kind of thing that teachers might use at early, early elementary, the kind of techniques that teachers need to use here are speaking, pointing, using gestures, uh, using tone of voice to help students understand. Uh, for example, in this case, look, here's a, a caterpillar, can you see? And uh, he's very hungry. So you can see that I'm pointing and that I'm using gestures um, and uh, to help students understand um, the introduction to the story. I'm not going to go much further into this, but uh, there, are, there are a number of techniques that you can use um, when using picture books, for example. Uh, and here are typical uh, activities. So students hear dog, cat or pasta, they touch a flashcard, uh, they hear, do you like dogs? And they reply with their own opinion. If it's a story that they might listen and then discuss it as a class or discuss it with their partner. Um, if you're doing listening at early uh, grades, it's often a good idea for students to listen in English, but talk about what they understand in their first language. Uh, so uh, Chinese, um, in the case of if you're, from, if you're teaching in China. But let's look at next steps, which is later elementary and junior high school. At junior high school, sounds and meaning are still important. So students still need to be listening and, and responding to what they hear. But, uh, and sorry, and students still need to hear slow, careful speech. Uh, but um, students also need to start linking sounds to written forms. And this adds an extra complication to listening. So the example listening teaching activities are the same. Uh, they're quite similar. Uh, to start with, you've got classroom instructions in English and you've got mini dialogues. But in late elementary and secondary, uh, early secondary school, you start to get dictations. Um, you also might get spelling and phonics activities and comprehension activities from a textbook. So we get the introduction of, of writing. Uh, and uh, rather than maybe listening to dog, cat, pasta and touching a, a flashcard, students have to start writing words. Um, they have to start filling in comprehension questions and completing gap fills. So first of all, what are some tips on research? Well, practicing speaking also improves students' listening ability. And there's uh, interesting evidence from a trial with foreign language learners who are using an artificial language which demonstrates this. So in this trial, um, students were separated into two groups. Group A focused on only on listening comprehension activities. This was group A, so they just practiced listening. Group B focused on speaking and spoken production with feedback. So this is group B. They weren't just listening, they were speaking and getting feedback on what they said. Now, it's not surprising that Group B was better than Group A at speaking. That's pretty obvious because Group B was practicing speaking. What's interesting is that Group B was also better. Group B also outperformed Group A on listening comprehension and grammar. So I think the key point here is that practicing speaking also improves students' listening ability. And this is particularly important um, in the early. Um, grades. Uh, students need to be not just listening but also speaking and those two skills reinforce they help each other. That's an important uh, takeaway for teachers. Okay, let's move on to look at uh, listening at senior high school. So um, students also need to link sounds to meaning and also to link sounds to written forms at, um, at senior high school. And as listening texts become more authentic, students need to hear um, and use uh, to hear and understand examples of connected speech. 
So the kind of teaching activities you might include are focused dictations, explicit pronunciation teaching, and both intensive and extensive listening. Intensive listening is where you listen to a, a, something very carefully, try and under, understand every sound of every word. And then extensive listening is like extensive reading, where you le listen to longer passages, um, but you don't worry so much if you don't understand everything that you hear. So we've said that, um, that uh, as students leave early primary school and get into secondary school, that listening starts to become bound up with, with writing and reading as well. So we're going to look at the role of dictations and reading. And here are three questions. Do dictations help students with listening? Uh, one teacher asked, another teacher asked, even though I do, oh, sorry, another teacher said, even though I do dictations, students don't seem to get better. And another teacher said, I've often heard that reading is important for listening. So what do reading and listening have in common? And what are the differences? And I'd like to start with that question first. So reading and listening have something in common. They're both language comprehension. So they've got that in common. Um, and Obviously, um, understanding the same grammar points, the same uh, vocabulary is, is, is something that reading and listening have in common. What, 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 what are the differences? I think um, there's two very key differences. One, when you're reading, you generally have more time. Uh, that means if you don't understand something, you can reread it, you can go back to it uh, and look at it again. Um, that's one big difference. And the other big difference is a very obvious one, but it needs to be reinforced. Um, reading is about recognising spellings, uh, but listening is about recognising sounds. And so that's the really key difference we need to think about uh, when we're helping students with listening. It's, it's recognising sounds that's the challenge for students. Let's have a look uh, at um, early literacy and how uh, spelling and, and reading can impact listening. When teachers do dictation, they need to think about what does dictation teach? And dictation teaches students how to link sounds of English with spellings. In other words, dictation is, is a technique for teaching reading and writing, and it links it to listening. But it's important to know that it's possible to be an excellent foreign language listener, even if you don't know how to read and write. And uh, I don't know if you've met anyone like this. I, I used to work with someone who could speak uh, seven or eight different languages through working on cruise ships. But this person um, couldn't read or write any of those languages. He, he could listen to them and he could speak them, but he couldn't read or write them. So, when you introduce uh, reading and writing to listening, you're adding an extra complication. Uh, and dictation helps students to link the sounds of words to their spelling. It links listening to reading and writing. So if we look at a word, the word frighten, the sounds in frighten are f, r, i, t, b, and n. And if you're doing a dictation, you need to link these sounds um, to the spelling. So f links to f, r links to r, i links to igh, that's the pattern that spells i, then t links to t, u links to the letter e, and n links to the letter n. So as you can see, this is quite complex and it's made more complex because English spelling is, um, it's, it's got what's called a deep orthography. So the, what that means is that the spelling and the sound link is not always very clear. Although it's not very clear, it does exist. There are lots of clues to, um, to pronunciation in English spelling and teaching these to students will be helpful. For example, in Frighten, the I-G-H, which spells the sound I, uh, also spells the sound I in the word high or fight or tight or might. So, this kind of pattern is helpful for students to know about. Uh, if students aren't learning the link between sounds and spellings, then dictation activities probably won't help. Uh, and we saw the teacher who said, oh, I do dictation, but it doesn't seem to help my students improve. But if students 
really don't know how English spelling and sounds are linked, then dictation probably won't be very helpful. And the same is true for, for reading aloud. So if we're doing dictation, we need to help students recognize the clues in English spelling uh, to how words are pronounced. And here's an example, a practical uh, teaching tip for how you can do this. So you might say, okay, um, I taught you um, the, the sound R, same sound that pirates make R, and it's spelt in English A-R. So we're going to practice. I'm going to uh, read you three words and I want you to spell them. The first word is car. Let me break that down. It's k, the same as in cat, and R, car. And then you can do the same with far and star. And you doing this kind of thing helps students to link the, the spelling patterns of English with sounds, and it helps linking, uh, it helps um, listening um, and uh, spelling and reading. So this kind of activity can be very helpful. If you're not sure, um, you know, if you're not sure yourself about how to um, to pick out useful spelling patterns, there's a, a very useful um, alphabet code website which has posters that you can download and print for free and this can be very helpful if you're doing this kind of dictation work. Um, I've also, uh, you'll be able to download later uh, after this session, a handout which has um, this link in it and the same QR code. Uh, one, another example, the, the, uh, the sound or is often spelled AU in English, like in audience, um, and other similar spellings for the same sound are O-R, as in fork, um, and um, O-A-R, as in or. Another useful resource is the Spelt, Spelfabet site, which has a list of common spellings um, and spelling patterns for the sounds of English. For example, the I, spelled with a Y in oxygen, um, which you, you can find um, in other words like gym or gymnasium. So we've looked um, at how you can help students by talking slowly and carefully. We've looked at how you can help them by uh, pointing to what you're describing. Um, and we've looked at how you can help them to um, link uh, spellings to sounds uh, through uh, dictation activities. But as students become more advanced, um, as they head up towards senior high school, or upper secondary, um, we have some more issues. So with a few exceptions, spellings don't change. Once a student has learned one spelling for a word, they should be able to recognize it every time they read it. However, the sounds of words can change. And the sound of words changes because of sentence stress and characteristics of the speaker. So we're going to look at that now. Let's look at these two sentences. The sounds of words can change. That's uh, what I just said. And I was stressing the word can because I, I was showing that that was a possibility. If I stress the word can, then the vowel sound in the middle sounds like a ah, when I say it. And that's the, the, the pronunciation of the word can that most students learn. They learn to pronounce can as can. But if I stress a different word in that sentence, then the sound of can changes. So let's listen to sentence two. The sounds of words can change. The sounds of words can change. Now, if I'm stressing change and I'm not stress and I'm not stressing can, then the vowel sound becomes quite different. It sounds like uh, and this is known as a schwa sound. And this might seem like a, a very small or trivial change, but if students are expecting to hear can, and instead they hear kun, they might not recognize it as the same word. And this is one of the challenges of um, spoken English. Depending on which words you stress, the other words in the sentence can start to sound different to the way you expect. Let's look at some other examples. So in speaking, articles and prepositions are often not stressed. Students may not easily catch these unstressed words. So let's see why. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see stressed and clear to. 
but it often sounds unstressed and faint, like t. You might expect to hear from, but actually it sounds like from. Or you might expect to hear the, but actually it sounds like the. Uh, some other sound changes in spoken English include soft pronunciation of word endings. So not start, but start, not moved, but move. And words that kind of run together. You, you don't hear a gap between each word, but they run together and then join up. For example, start, the day after. The day after is three words, but they're all joined together. We're going to look at an example. Uh, this is an example taken of, of, sorry, we're going to look at an example of student challenges. And this is taken from a national test in Japan. Um, this was a national test. And after the test was taken um, and the student answers were analyzed, a, a lot of students got the wrong answer to this um, item, even though it was supposed to be quite a simple answer, a simple, simple item to answer. So the audio that students heard sounded like this. Question number three. To start working in Hiroshima next week, Yuji moved from Chiba the day after graduation. And students were asked to choose from these options. So Yuji is living in Chiba, Yuji is studying in Chiba, Yuji will begin his job next week, and Yuji will graduate next week. And many students chose number one, Yuji is living in Chiba. And the reason they chose number one is because they didn't clearly hear all the words uh, in the audio, particularly two key words. Question number three. To start working in Hiroshima next week, Yuji moved from Chiba the day after graduation. And the words they didn't hear were to, to start, that sounded like to start, and from, which sounds like from, from Chiba. And that's why uh, they thought that maybe Yuji was living in Chiba. Question number whereas three. In fact, uh, Yuji will. To start working in Hiroshima. Sorry, whereas in fact, the answer is number three. Yuji will begin his job next week. Um, He's not living in Chiba anymore, he moved from Chiba. So we can see that what seems like a tiny sound change can actually be a big problem for students, a big challenge when they're listening to English. So a practical teaching technique that you can use is ear training. And I'm going to demonstrate this. Number one, you, you play a very short extract of an audio. And then you don't give students any context because you want them just to focus on the sounds of the audio. It's got to be very short, otherwise it gets very tiring for students. Uh, two, students write all the sounds they hear. You play the extract several times and get students to compare their answers. And then say the same extract yourself slowly and clearly. Point five, students discuss how the sounds changed. And this activity, this ear training activity, helps students to get used to the kind of sound changes that appear in authentic English, the kind of English you'd hear on television or in a movie, or if you, you met a, an English speaking person. I'm going to demonstrate how this technique, uh, what this technique is like. So perhaps you can try this uh, as you're listening to the webinar. You'll hear an audio extract. If you've got a pen and some paper ready, please listen and try and note down any of the sounds you hear. Some sounds, you may be able to shape into words, others maybe not. Don't worry, uh, just write down the sounds you can hear. If you have a pen and a piece of paper ready, let's go. It's the main attraction. It was very cold though. Remember, some sounds you may not be able, sorry, some sounds you may be able to shape into words, others maybe not. Let's try again. It's the main attraction. It was very cold though. 
And I'm going to give you one more chance to listen. It's the main attraction. It was very cold though. Okay. It's the main attraction. It was very cold though. If we say it slowly, you'll hear that was the main attraction. It was very cold though. Kind of things that students might write down is they might hear main, they might hear very, they might hear cold, but some of the other sounds that they found, they will find difficult to catch. It's the main attraction. It was very cold though. So then you can ask students to compare. So what did you, what sounds did you hear? What, if we see, uh, if we see the, what this person said written down, what's changed? What sounds were the same? What sounds were different? What sounds were missing? We can see that that is just missing, wasn't it? And the was, all we hear is the z at the end. And the th sound is also missing. So that was the sounds like z, z. Main and attraction have kind of joined together. So it's main attraction, main attraction. So that's joined into two words. And instead of hearing it, the sound t, and was, the sound w, it just sounds like is, is very cold. And finally, the though, the O sound, just sounds like a, it's very cold. So those are the sounds that were the same, the sounds that were different, and the sounds that were missing. It's the main attraction, it's very cold though. And doing this kind of a short activity can help students to understand that they're not being stupid or lazy uh, when they don't uh, catch everything in English. But in authentic spoken English, lots of sounds change. And um, becoming aware of that can help them to become better listeners. The kind of listening resources that are really helpful for students to notice this kind of thing are songs. And songs are excellent because, uh, first of all, you can listen to a song again and again without uh, getting bored of it. Secondly, you can look at the lyrics and you can compare what you're hearing and what's written down. And this helps you to understand the sound changes of English. Um, other kind of resources that can be helpful, things like TED Talks, which also often have the written form, so you can compare what you've heard and, and, and the transcript. Uh, podcasts sometimes have this too. So these are the kind of resources that can be helpful uh, to use with micro listening and also um, for students to listen to at home and practice um, uh, noticing the, uh, the differences between you know, careful speech and, and authentic speech. Just before we move on, I'm going to have a quick look at the chat to see if there are any. Um, I, I see people have been, uh, I see people have been trying out the, the activity. That's great. So we're going to move on to another teacher question. I'm going to deal with this quite quickly, which is a single play or double play. So the teacher question is, what should I do to improve listening in lessons? In some tests and real life, students only listen once. Should I imitate this in lessons? First of all, let's look at some research. So a study into double play versus single play in tests showed that double play reduces test anxiety. So students feel more comfortable if they know they've got the chance to hear it twice. And single play slightly reduces overall test scores. But the difference between lower and higher proficiency test takers doesn't change. So basically everyone's scores go down a little bit if they only listen once. Um, and this uh, research can be found in a British Council publication by researcher John Field called Rethinking the Second Language Listening Test. So I think the important takeaway for teachers here is that um, students don't need a lot of practice listening only once. Um, it's not going to make a big difference uh, one way or the other. Uh, and it, um, in a listening lesson, really, what you want to focus on is helping students to get better at listening. That usually means they need to listen several times. Uh, once is not, not really enough if you're trying to help students to learn um, from a listening lesson. 
Next, we're going to look at different accents. So we um, earlier we said that um, sentence dress can make a big difference. Uh, it can be a big challenge for students, um, and and um, and depending on the sentence dress, uh, words will sound different. But the other uh, thing that can be a challenge is is characteristics of the speaker. So speakers with different accents. And here are two questions from teachers. Most of my teaching materials are in US English. So how should I help students handle other accents? And another teacher said, I find it easy to understand UK English, but struggle with US English. Are there any strategies to help with this? So let's look at what challenges students have with accents. When we listen to English, we often recognize words by their stressed vowel sounds. That's what helps us to distinguish different words. But the biggest difference between varieties of English is the pronunciation of vowel sounds. Here's um, some quite well-known examples using US and uh, UK English. So in the US, um, the first word would be something like bath. But in the UK, in my accent, it would be bath. So instead of an air, it's kind of R sound. And someone from the north of England might say bath. Um, let's look at the example underneath. So uh, again, someone from the US might say wada. And here the, the vowel sound changes. Uh, sorry, the vowel sound is different to my vowel sound. Also, the, the consonant is not t, but d, wada. If I was saying that, I'd say water. So it's a t sound, and it's also an or sound for the vowel. And finally, another clear example, uh, someone from the US might say cafe, and I would say coffee. So this is the difference to be aware, main, main difference to be aware of um, when encountering an unfamiliar accent. And again, these might seem very small and trivial differences. They might seem like something not to worry too much about, but, uh, John Field, who's the researcher I referred to earlier, says, encountering an unfamiliar accent is likely to have a disproportionate effect on word recognition. And this is especially the case um, for beginner learners. Um, so students who are beginners, if they, they're expecting to hear bath and they hear bath, they just won't recognize it in, in a lot of cases. So it is, it's an important point, um, it's an important challenge for students. Uh, and, and actually, incidentally, it's not just second language learners that face this challenge. Um, uh, I remember that my brother, um, who comes from uh, the UK, uh, when he was 14, he went on a foreign exchange to the US and it took him and his host family uh, about a day before they could get used to each other's accents and understand each other clearly. So it's a, it's a problem with different varieties of English for all kinds of uh, learners and also uh, people who are proficient in English. There is good news. Your ear can adapt to different accents and the experiments show that this can occur very rapidly. So in lab tests, listeners adapted after hearing only two to four sentences in an unfamiliar accent, which is great news. Uh, and the research, um, again, you can find the link uh, in this handout. Um, that's good news, but of course, if you're uh, taking a, a high stakes listening test and there's an unfamiliar accent and you might only hear one or two lines in that unfamiliar accent, it will, it will be a, a big barrier to you. So we can adapt, or you, your ear can adapt, but you need to become familiar with different accents. So I think the takeaway for teachers here is that uh, teachers and students can adopt a positive mindset for listening to speakers with different accents. Um, students should hear different varieties of English before they take important tests. And there are plenty of listening resources available online. The BBC has some, uh, British Council, ABC, you can find uh, online um, uh, places that have um, different um, listening resources. And again, um, you'll find a link to the British Council resources in this handout. Um, and also teachers don't need to make big changes in their teaching for different accents. Uh, students will adapt with exposure to different accents. Um, and a teaching tip is that it can be helpful to demonstrate how sounds change in different accents. 
This doesn't require complicated explanations or drills. So here's an example, Robin's from Kent in the UK. Notice how he says castle. The vowel sounds like R. On the other hand, Eric is from Colorado in the US. Notice how he says castle. It's not R, but eh. And that's really all that teachers need to do. It's just a, a, a mimic uh, and, and pointing out the sound that's changed. You don't even need to mimic it very well. I'm not very good at um, copying different accents, as you might have noticed. You just need to get close enough to help students notice where the difference is. We're running um, uh, towards the end of this session. I want to very, very briefly look at note taking and then we're going to move on to questions. So two questions um, from teachers about note taking. Some people have told me that taking memos during listening is helpful, while others say that it's not a good idea. What should I do? And how should students deal with listening tasks in tests? Should they take notes? If they should take notes, how should I teach them to do this? Um, so key point here is that taking notes in academic lectures is a useful technique which can help boost memory of the contents of the lecture. So it is worth teaching students note taking techniques. However, there's little evidence that note taking makes a difference to listening comprehension in a second language test. So if you're hoping to help students get better scores on listening tests, the note taking is not usually going to be a very helpful strategy. And one reason may be that speakers don't usually pause in tests to allow time for listeners to write their notes. So if students are writing notes and listening at the same time, they're multitasking, and that often leads to shallower listening and less effective listening. In one study, when students were urged to take notes in a test, I think it was the TOEFL test of English, it had a negative impact on their listening comprehension. So in other words, if you encourage students, please take notes while you're, you're taking a listening test, it's actually likely to be counterproductive. It, it, students might get worse scores. Um, however, there are some note-taking tasks in tests. Um, and, and in that case, I think you just need to help students become familiar with those kind of tasks. But this is the, the, the task. Students need to um, listen to four speakers and they need to decide which speaker is in favour of electronic receipts, which one is neutral, and which one is against electronic receipts. Um, students need to read the setup, understand the situation and the demands of the task, and make notes while listening, which is an example of multitasking. Now, if students started writing words um, in each box, it's likely that the note taking would interfere with listening, and it would actually probably not help them very much. So the most effective notes for this kind of task are symbols rather than words. So as you listen, you work out that Kate uh, is in favour, that Michael was against, so was Luke, and that Yasuko um, didn't express a clear opinion. And that allows you to answer the question. Um, this is the kind of uh, advice that you can give to students. Uh, if they're listening to a lecture, if especially if the lecturer pauses, uh, taking notes is a good idea. Uh, if it's a note-taking task in an exam, they need to look at the specific task and try and make their notes as simple as possible so that they don't, so that they don't interfere with listening. And that brings me to the end of the session. The two questions I'd like you to think about is, are, what was your key takeaway from today's session? Is there anything you want to change as a result of today's session? While you're thinking about these questions, I'm going to, to hand back to, um, to Jamie uh, for the Q&A. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Robin. That's great. And now we are going to move to the Q&A session. And uh, in the Q&A uh, box, I can see some very good questions and I'm going to read some to you. And so you can, um, you know, you can talk to the audience and see, uh, you know, the questions, where are the questions? So the first one is um, from uh, Lin Pei Zhang. Oh, he or she asked about how to train students effectively to have a better attention span and focus more to follow the flow better when they are doing listening. 
So this is the question from one of the audience. Okay, thanks very much for that, Chairman. That's a, a good question. I think uh, something that we haven't really touched on in this session is, um, is metacognitive skills, but that's um, a key part of, of being a good listener. So often when you when you're listening to a foreign language, you have very high expectations. And you think if if you don't catch one word, then it's a disaster. And then you start to panic and think, I can't understand anything. So training students, showing them that it's quite normal, even in your own language, you don't always understand everything you hear. Um, and to um, you know, keep listening, not panic, uh, and, and, and be aware that your ear will get used to listening. These are important things you can share with students. Uh, it's interesting, for example, when um, uh, people who work in call centres are often advised to give a greeting at the start of the, when they, uh, when they answer the phone, a greeting before they give their name. And the reason for that is the first couple of things we hear, we often don't process and don't understand. So sharing that with students is one way of, of helping them to improve their attention span and, and not panic when they realise that they're not understanding everything. Okay, and uh, there's another one uh, from Da Ye Wang, and the question is, hi Robin, would you please share with us your view on what kind of speaking activities best improve listening comprehension ability? Ah, that's, that's a good question. I think mainly this is to do with um, people beginning actually to, to, to learn the language. It's important to include speaking um, and, and listening from the start of learning a foreign language. So really, in, in that case, um, it, can be, um, it can be as simple as short role plays, um, small conversations um, with, other, with other students. Um, and the other kind of thing that can be helpful is, um, for example, if students listen to a picture book and then they role play the characters in the, in the, in the picture book, these kind of activities help. Um, students get used to the sounds of English, not only hearing them, but producing them themselves. Uh, so I think it's, um, that's the key is that when you start teaching English, there's an expectation that students are not just listening, but they're also trying to say things themselves. Okay. And another question from Wu Xiaoqing. Um, so uh, it's about dictation. Um, she said, if it's better for us to focus on giving students the dictation about sentences or words. Ah, so that's a, a good question. And I think it depends on the stage of the learner. So if they're beginners, um, then you need to do word level dictation. And that's actually very helpful um, for consolidating hearing words and linking them to spelling. But as uh, students become more proficient, and then moving on to, to sentences and, and short paragraphs is important. But obviously, if students can't, if you, if students are struggling to write individual words, there's no point giving them dictation with sentences. So I think start with small parts and build up is a useful advice. Okay. And uh, another question from CC said, should we summarize some common accent differences? and the Leon zones before classes, or is it better to let students find these through classroom activities? Uh, I think it's much better to do it through classroom activities. Um, if you're kind of summarizing it, you're giving students lots of information that they can't use. But what's most helpful is if they're going to listen to us, let's say usually they're listening, in where I work in Japan, most students listen to Ameri people with American accents. So if you were going to introduce a speaker from Singapore or from uh, Australia, then when you introduce that speaker, that's where you can help students notice how their pronunciation of words is a bit different to what they're used to. So doing it through activities and exposure is much better than, than kind of just a lecture with, with information, I think. Okay. Um... Another question from an uh, anonymous teacher. <laughs> um, when I do the dictation of English new words to the students, there are two ways. One way, one way is I speak the Chinese meaning and students write English words. 
The other way is I pronounce the English words and they write the English words. Which way do you think is better? Students told me that their English teacher followed the first one in high school. Ah, but they're, they're testing different things, I think. So if you're if you're saying the sound of the word and you're asking students to write it down, then what you're focusing on is this is how the word sounds and can you can you spell those sounds? So if you're doing that, I think you need to make sure that it's not just a testing activity, but a teaching activity. And so you might say, for example, if you're dictating the word a nightmare, you might say, well, the, the I is the same as in high and fight. It's, that's, the, that's the spelling for that I. So you're making it into a teaching activity focusing on sounds and spellings. If you're doing um, meaning and then students write the spelling, then you're kind of just testing how, how well they can recall those words. Uh, and I think both of those, you might start out by focusing on sounds and spelling, and later you might just say, well, here's the word, here's the meaning of the word, can you write it down? They're both, uh, they're both valid activities, but they focus on different things. Okay. Uh, another question from PC. Um, reciting the listening part is useful to improve their listening or just following the original listening? are getting students to recite what they've heard. Mm -hmm. I think this can be a useful activity. Um, I, I think it's, it can be a useful activity, although I'm not sure it's one that, I think it can be overused as an activity, um, but it, it can be useful um, uh, to help students uh, kind of, it's what's, uh, Doing this kind of thing helps to make it, uh, helps students to pay attention to all the words that they've heard, and it might help them clear up some of the things that they didn't hear clearly when they were listening. So I think it can have some use, um, but, but, um, but generally speaking with a listening activity, I think uh, you might want to pick out some useful phrases from the listening rather than reciting the whole thing. Or, or okay, so, yeah. sorry, I was going to say the two two things you could. One is if there was one particular part of the listening that students found difficult to hear, you might focus on helping them recite that and then listen again. Or if there were useful words and phrases from the listening that you wanted students to use in a speaking activity, you might get them to focus on those. But just reciting the whole listening again, I'm not sure that's the best use of classroom time necessarily. Right. Okay. So another question from Huan Xiang Wu. Uh, will it be overwhelming for students to use materials with various accents? Ah, oh, that's a really good question, um, actually. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think, um, again, it depends. There's, there was, I saw some interesting research on this quite recently, which said that younger learners were more likely to be confused if they heard a lot of different accents, and older learners and adults were actually learn better when they heard lots of different um, um, accents. So I think it makes sense to think that at primary level, the kids probably don't want to hear lots and lots and lots of different accents. Um, maybe they want to hear their teacher speaking English and then maybe one or two other people speaking English. But as you get towards um, secondary and especially senior high school level, it's pretty important to know that English is a world language that is spoken differently around the world. Um, and and to, to hear examples of that. Otherwise, um, what tends to happen is that when you encounter English in the real world, you don't recognize it because you haven't been prepared. Right, okay. Um, we have another question uh, is from Jia, Jia Ling Li. Um, I usually speed up the, record, the records after the students understand the idea. Is that help? Is that help? Or I always ask students to catch each single sound from the normal speed listening. Ah, oh, uh, okay. So that, um, that's kind of two questions, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so if I handle the each sound bit first, I think that's an example of intensive listening. And I think intensive listening can be helpful, but again, it should be done in short doses because it's very tiring trying to catch every sound. So uh, that kind of in the session we looked at ear training that kind of short focused activity where you're trying to catch um, 
everything that someone said can be helpful, but very soon students will get exhausted if they're trying to do that for a long period of time. So I suggest that's a good short focused activity. As for speeding things up, I'm not really sure that's, I mean, when you speed something up, you kind of distort the way it sounds. So rather than speeding up um, audio, I would suggest trying to find more authentic listening materials to, to, to help students. Um, I think that would probably be more helpful uh, approach. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have still, we have more questions coming, but uh, I don't think we, we have more time to talk about all the questions here, but uh, uh, we will answer. We will download all the questions and we're going to put uh, the answers in written form and then we'll upload them to the British website, British Council website, all right? So um, can we have the last but one slide on the screen? Yes. The last but one, uh, yes, okay. Yes. So um, for, so um, I'm going to do the roundup and uh, you know, uh, Robin has done a great job today and talk about the motivation, the stages of listening and uh, you know, all the uh, detailed information about all levels of teachers, what they can do. And we can have a lot to take away, a lot of practical ideas to take away, I'm sure. And also with the, um, Q and A sessions. We can see all the audience are really active, and they ask a lot of interesting and uh, useful uh, questions, good ones as well. And um, but um, so we are going to uh, have all the questions downloaded and then put uh, put the answers after the session as well. So don't worry if your questions are not chosen this time. All right. So if you can have a look at the screen, you can find out more about the next event uh, and register through the QR code on the right. So you can, you know, next session is about uh, return, uh, about product and process approaches to teaching writing effectively. That is the, the day after tomorrow, okay. So for the certificates and recordings and downloads, you know, a lot of teachers actually ask about the PowerPoints and the handouts, very useful ones. And they will be uh, made uh, available here within seven days. Okay, so you can check online on British Council website and everything is for free, but don't make uh, you know, miss us the next session. Remember, we have the next session on uh, October the 14th, same time. So we'll see you there, okay? So thank you all for the uh, participating and for the good questions as well. Okay, we'll see you the day after tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.